Amen. I realise we only have a short semester. And we have, from what I can see, a mixed class. Some people are very familiar with the message and some people are not so familiar. So what I wanted to do, at least to begin with, and we'll see where the class takes us, is to look at some introductory material and we're going to just focus on the great controversy, the book, and we're going to be looking at the first angel's message. So in your notes, what you'll see are, I think it's the first five references to the first angel's message in the book, The Great Controversy. And all we really want to do is to read through those paragraphs to actually try to understand what the first angel's message meant to the Millerites, what God's design was for that message, um, the successes and the failures that the Millerites had when they received the message and then shared it with their generation. So that's, that, that's where the class is going, at least to begin with. Before we begin reading, <coughs> so um, we'll be in chapter 17, in the original it's page 299, that's where and again, it's in your notes, it's, there's, a, there's a small header there. The paragraph that we're looking at is uh, GC 311, paragraph 2, but the chapter begins, um, page 299. Before we look at the great controversy, I just want to make um, some brief comments, and we'll come back to this um, over and over again, really, to see the comparison. Now, we know that the Great Controversy, the 1911 version, am I loud enough for everybody? Can you all still hear me at the back? Um, was essentially the last book that Ellen White wrote on the subject of the Great Controversy. I know it wasn't her last book on the Conflict of the Ages series. She had one more uh, that was after that. But when we think about the Great Controversy from the beginning to the end, um, this book was the, the final version of that. I know it begins in the destruction of Jerusalem. The first work that you see um, where she's talking about the great controversy is in a book called Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, um, again, is um, a series of articles that were put together from slightly earlier work. But the earliest place, I think, that we pick up this concept of the Great Controversy is 1857, just after the 1850 charts, not long after that. And uh, it was put together into a book called Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. I don't know if we're familiar with the book or you've read it. Um, there's another book called Story of Redemption. Story of Redemption is a compilation. It's not an original work, and it draws heavily from spiritual gifts. Now, the book Spiritual Gifts I'm pretty sure it was 1857, um, is around the same time as Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1. <coughs> Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, is a series of testimonies or articles or statements that Ellen White writes over a number of years. They're collated together and put into what they called Volume 1, and then you go up to Volume 9. A lot of the early material in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, is contained in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. Now, as the years went on, we know that the church lost its direction. I don't know where, how everybody sees the transition from Philadelphia to Laodicea. Um, maybe I could ask, where, where would we place um, our church coming into Laodicea? What year? Did people have an idea on? Brother Gregory? Uh, 
to start way back in the 1850s. Okay, so most people are going to perhaps think 1844. So you've said 1850s. Yeah, like early. Did it start then? So uh, anyone else? Brother Bob? I would say the early 1850s. Early 1850s? Mr. Carroll? I'd just be guessing. I would say probably the latter part of the 40s or, or you know, 18, well, I know that William Miller died in uh, 1849. I'm, I'm, I'd okay, maybe the late 40s. Brother James? Um, off the top of my head, I would guess early 50s. But Okay, it's not easy to find. I don't think uh, 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 there aren't that many places that you're going to find an actual statement. Uh, Sister Bronwyn? <coughs> 1863. 1863. So it's uh, it's a lot before 1863. Ellen White actually starts talking about the subject. Um, at least you can pick it up in 57. Um, you can pick that up from Testaments of the Church, Volume 1. You see articles in 57 where she's already talking about the church being in a latency and condition. Um, I'd go for 1850. We're going to look for a date. Um, I'd pick 1850 as a waymark connected to the chart. And if you're going to pick 1850 or maybe sometime later, at least we're in the same ballpark. Um, I'd go for 1850. Anybody got any comments on that? James White, in 1850, commented on the Laodicean condition, but, I, I've, but I'm not 100% certain on that. Yeah, I think you, you can find some hints to it, um, but prophetically, I'd be marking it with the 1850 chart, um, without going into the details of why that is, but I'm sure we can, we know for certain it's in the 50s, because by the time you get to the late 50s, uh, Alan White either is stating it as a matter of fact that the church is already in the later scene condition. Uh, spiritual gifts is written around this kind of time. This later scene condition we know goes from bad to worse and by the time you get to 1888, I'm sure most of us are familiar with the, at least to some level, of the history that's going on in the church, the fight between the leadership of the church and the two men that have been raised up, Wagner and Jones. I think in this movement all of us are familiar with that story. And perhaps most of us are also familiar with the lead up to that story. So if I were to say 1884, what would that mean to you, Brother Clayton, 1884? No, no, no. no idea? Uh, Brother Larry, 1884? Brother Daniel? Okay. Um, Sister Kathy? The last open vision. The last open vision. Sister Ellen? Oh, that's what I was going to say. Okay. The last open vision. So d does that make sense to people? Have they heard of this? So Ellen White has a vision. An open vision would be visions in front of people. She has the first vision. Is it December, I think? Um, 1844. It's in 1844. The, the year's for certain, I think it's December, it may not be December. And um, she has this in public, in front of people, and the last vision that she has that's in front of people is in 1884. And people have used the term open vision. After that, she continues to have visions, but they, uh, people would call them, say, night visions. She has them in private by herself. People are not there when she's ha having those visions. So why is, the re why is it that she has her last vision in 1884? Um, you'll have noticed that it's 40 years. So she has this 40 years ministry. And then we'd pick up the year 1888. And it won't be a coincidence that it's a tenth of that if you just want to lay out a structure. I'm not trying to 
lay out anything significant. It's just an introductory thought before we start reading the Great Controversy. Um, there's information there that we'd need to really dig into and understand about the relationship between the 40 and the 4. Um, <coughs> Does anybody know why this is her last open vision? <coughs> Bob? Because the people were rejecting her as the prophet. So Ellen White had a bad habit, we can put it that way, of openly criticising people, church members, particularly the leadership. If they were doing things wrong, um, she would correct them. And some of those private letters <coughs> found their way into the public domain, not by accident, they weren't leaks. Um, they were done deliberately and they tended to be put into the testimonies, volumes one to nine. We're, not, we're nowhere near volume nine at this stage, but they're put into the public domain. And even though they may hide the name, people who knew who they were talking about. And there became a resistance to her ministry. And this resistance needed, resistance needed to be justified. The justification of uh, the pushback against her ministry was that not everything that she wrote was inspired. Uh, some of it was her opinions. So if um, you're behaving badly, uh, it's my opinion that you're behaving badly and I could comment on that, but it doesn't mean God told me that you're bad. Now they started off uh, not on that track, but a non-easier one. For instance, her relationship with her children, her spouse, and the communications that they may or may not have. And it would be, I think, I don't know, I'll say, I think it's obvious that those statements are not inspired. When she writes to her sons, and says, uh, be good and I'm missing you. They're not inspired statements as a prophet. Uh, they're statements that have been written by a mother. And without looking at her ministry in that perspective, I think we can get into some problems. The people recognise that, those people who wanted to use that as leverage against her. So they started off gently and then they'd end up getting to a place where they'd, insti they'd, they'd bring in doubt in the minds of the people about which bits of her work were inspired and which bits are not inspired. And it doesn't stop there because you know a normal person like us would say, hold on, she's a prophet. Everything that she says must be inspired. And so they go one step further and what they end up doing is saying, by the way, you know that not everything in the Bible is inspired either. And then they have to go to justify that. And they're actually going to print to show passages in the Bible that they believe are not inspired statements. They're opinions of the Bible writers. So you get, by the time you get to 1884, um, God's had enough of all of this. So as a punishment or a rebuke to the church, he withdraws the prophetic gift um, in this open setting. So... For those who know, I think, is that anybody want to add any more? For those who know about that story, have I missed something? Just that, um. Well, it started in um, Portland, Maine. Good, so we'll, we'll put that then. So it starts in Portland, Maine. Portland, Maine. It's in Portland, Oregon. And it ends in Portland. Portland, um, Oregon. And then it just occurred to me that port means open, like a door. Okay. So it was like a door. God had a door for us. For open us and yeah, and got open close. So we'd have um, an open door. And then I guess you're going to say a shut door. And then we can do an alpha and omega. So there's a number of things we can see about that. So essentially, the church is, there, is without a public voice of rebuke. Alan White's ministry is going to change subtly. So, I've, well, I've, spoke, I've mentioned briefly about the book Spiritual Gifts. Um, it's her first work on what I would call the great controversy. It begins with the fall of Satan and it ends with the second death to the end of the millennium. Um, it's not a long book. 
but it covers essentially all the history that you need, which is covered in the Conflict of the Ages series. Now, our focus normally is on the Great Controversy, and it deals with all of the highlights that you find in the Great Controversy, the 1911 edition, in this book, Spiritual Gifts. Um, the church has gone from bad to worse, as I say, from 1850. We're going to speak about 1850 and the the issue of going into Laodicea as we go through our classes. Now, before we're going to get to 1888, um, God is going to begin to prepare the people. And I'm suggesting one of the preparatory works that he's going to put together is a certain book. Uh, what book is that? I mean, I know I'm, I'm, some of this material I've covered in recent classes before, so if you already know the answer, you've already watched those classes, or you're in those classes, please don't answer. Uh, it's for those people who are new. What book is he going to introduce into the church to prepare people for 1888? Because that's the narrative that I want to introduce this book as, that it wasn't uh, just a random book introduced randomly into the church. It was premeditated by God. Famous book. Early writings. Early writings. Do you know what year? Obviously, it's close to 1888. Um, it's in the year 1882. So the book, uh, Early Writings, is exactly what it says. It's a collection of early material that um, essentially had been forgotten um, they put two books together, Experience in Views and Spiritual Gifts. There's a, a supplement, uh, it's called The Supplement, which is an explanation of some passages that people didn't understand in the earlier works. They collect these three, piece, these three books, essentially, put them together in the book called Early Writings. And I'm suggesting the reason or the purpose of this book is to prepare God's people for 1888. 1888 is the call for God's church to get its house in order before the Sunday laws come in. Any questions or comments? <coughs> um, it's Experience and Views, that's, the, that's one of the major books. The other one is called Supplement. It was a supplement um, because in her early works, um, she's not an experienced writer. She doesn't have a team of copy editors. Um, there's only James White that's doing that work for her. And some of her, of her language is um, problematic. It's difficult to understand. She would say, as one example, I saw a time of trouble. And people didn't understand what she meant by the time of trouble. They thought it was what we understand, the time of trouble, from Daniel chapter 12 which is what your natural assumption would be. And if you believe that, you'd see that there were some contradictory statements that she was making. So she has to go back and explain herself and said, when I said time of trouble, I didn't really mean time of trouble. I meant a time of trouble before the time of trouble. It's things like that. Her language isn't precise enough um, because she's got a wide audience and people are really analysing what her, uh, her writings are. So she has to go back and put some supplements or some explanations of what she wrote. By the time she gets her team of copy editors um, into full swing, things get a lot more precise and, and there's not that much explanation, explaining that needs to be done because they go over, the, they review the material over and over again before it ever gets published. Sorry? Uh, it, experience and Views, Supplement and Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1. And I'm suggesting that the reason these uh, books are being given to the church is because they've forgotten the foundational material and the leadership are no longer really doing their work. And so these books are going to serve as the tools that God's people can use to be prepared for what's about to come. Now, if that's true, and I think that it is, um, the book Spiritual Gifts 
would actually be able to prepare you for the lateral rain. If that, if that assertion is correct, uh, and I'm arguing that it is, that the, that the purpose of these books were to prepare you for the lateral rain. And if that's the case, then we know that the conflict of the ages, the five books, which are a far more expanded version of spiritual gifts, are also the books that, are, that God has designed for us, uh, for his people to prepare us for the latter rain. And, and most of us haven't spent enough time reading those five books. Um, I know today, with raffia, you know, hard on our heels and we're really... People are getting nervous, we don't think there's much time. People think uh, that it's perhaps a waste of time or there's not enough time to read those books. And um, I think I'd argue otherwise that um, those books are essential for us to know. And in fact, this movement, the message that we teach, forces you to go and read those books over and over again. But there's still so many things that we're missing from them. So that's one of the reasons why we're looking at the Great Controversy. Just wanted to make that parallel. What the reason we're looking at the Great Controversy is to, I don't want to, I'm not, I'll say to, to encourage us, I'll say to force us, to encourage us to review that book and to begin reading it again. Any questions? So I'm saying? Um, in 1884, they, Ellen White wrote uh, Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 4, which is the Great Controversy, so that would have also been preparing people for yes. 1888. Yes, um, so the Great Controversy doesn't begin, and we know it's not 1911, there's an 1888 version, there's an 1884 version, and there's this preliminary one, as I said, spiritual gift. So I'm suggesting that early writings is the alpha work, GC 1911 is the omega work, they're both covering the same material, and when we look at any particular chapter in the Great Controversy, it's a good idea to go back to early writings to see the differences and the similarities between uh, those two books and how she approaches whatever subject she's dealing with. Um, the language in early writings are, is a lot easier, the chapters are a lot, uh, a lot shorter. So you know, we can get lost, as an example, I know um, at your fellowship you're doing chapter 40. Chapter 38, 39 and 40 are important for us in the time period in which we're living. And sometimes, uh, you know, those chapters are pages and pages long. We can get lost in the detail of those uh, chapters, particularly chapter 38. And I think a really nice summary is if you were to go to Spiritual Gifts, uh, Volume 1, and see how Ellen White deals with that same history and she does it in really only a few pages. And when you do the back-to-back -back comparison, you'll see the similarities and the differences. And it really gives you a good anchoring of how to even approach um, the chapters in The Great Controversy. I think it was mentioned yesterday even about not taking paragraphs out of context. We should read them in context and see the flow of what she's trying to show us. And I agree with that uh, concept. But on top of that, looking at a parallel book and seeing how she approaches the problem then um, is a really useful aid. So um, if we turn to the Great Controversy, we're on page 299, paragraph 1. It's chapter 37 if you have pagination and your books are different. By and large, Spiritual Gifts Volume 1 and The Great Controversy are in chronological order. There is some overlap. There are some chapters that stretch um, over dispensations, over histories. So you'd be following a sequence and then you'd go to chapter, say, 15, 16, 17. And then chapter 17 might take you back a bit but it essentially still follows on um, with a nice flow. So there is this 
Uh, sometimes she does flashbacks in a chapter. She'll take you back um, as a flashpoint to give you an introductory thought for that chapter, and then she'd pick up again. Obviously, we in the movement realize and recognize where she does repeat and enlarge. So she does that over and over again. But it's not repeat and enlarge that I'm addressing when I mean that she does flashbacks or that she um, goes back upon herself and then continues the thought. I'm talking about in the, in the actual narrative of the book. So chapter uh, 17, Heralds of the Morning. So the first thing we want to do, because the titles themselves are very instructive, is to ask, what were the heralds of the morning? So before we, we've got two, there's four words there, two key words. What are the two key words we want to look at? The heralds and the morning. So what is the morning? Before we deal with what the heralds are. What is the morning that's being dealt with? It's a simple answer, nothing complicated. Brother Richard. First thing that comes to my mind is the time after darkness, the time after the night. Sunrising. Okay. It's time after darkness. Sister Tess? Time of the end. The time of the end? Increase of light. Mm -hmm. The increase of light. Mm -hmm. Do we want to put like a, an event, a date? So uh, we've got time of the end. 1798. It's time of the end. Anyone else? Okay, so what is that? Oh, sorry, Brother Bob. Wouldn't you even place it back at the birth of Martin Luther? Okay, so would we place it at the birth of Martin Luther? Uh, why would we not do that, Brother Bob? No, uh, obviously you said we, we will. Brother Jim, why wouldn't we place it that far back? We haven't read the chapter, so he might be correct. But as a first assumption, why would we not do that? Okay, uh, Brother Clayton, why wouldn't we do that? I'm not sure on that one. I didn't get the connection to that for the morning, so... Oh, why he's making that connection? Yeah. Uh, so, he, um, someone said morning comes after darkness, so you've got the dark and the light. We talk about the dark ages. I'm assuming that's what people are thinking. The dark ages, they can take you up to 1798, but there was a light that began to shine in the Protestant Reformation. So he's saying, maybe we could pick it up from even the Protestant Reformation, that this light began to shine, even though the full brightness, we know that there's a period of darkness preceding the time of the end. When we do a reform line, we say there was darkness and then there's the time of the end. We, we, we do that. So that's why people have, I think, said time of the end. And they said, well, actually there was light even before that. So why would we not go so far back? Brother Tyler. Because there, that's the period of darkness? It's the period of darkness. <clears throat> well, when I, when I hear the words heralds of the morning, it's almost like the early songbirds. They're, they're singing before it's morning. Mm. Uh, and that's why he's saying the Protestant Reformation. So um, w when I ask questions, they, they, I try to d have directed questions. So I want us to become familiar, not only with my teaching style, but perhaps your own teaching style and how you would teach someone. So if you remember, what was the introductory thought I gave before I asked that question? We went through great controversy. I said early writing. So I've, I paralleled the two books. I did that. And then I said that the great controversy is being written in a particular style, just like early writings was, and that was in chronological order. And then I asked the question, so we're at the Heralds of the Morning, what would the morning be? And some people have said the time of the end, and, some and someone has said, perhaps it's talking about the Protestant Reformation, and they said, why wouldn't it be that? So what would we be looking at? Aftermath. We're in chapter 17, so you go to the table of contents, which we probably would argue is an uninspired thing. It's a construction. And if you went back a few uh, chapters, 
you went to chapter 10. The title is Progress, Progress of the Reformation in Germany, uh, 10, uh, sorry, 11, Process of the Princes, the French Reformation. So you can see the Reformation has already been dealt with structurally in the book. Now, as I say, we haven't read the chapter, so she might be doing, so, uh, she may do a flashback to uh, the Protestant Reformation, but the title is going to be the theme of the chapter, and because she's already dealt with uh, extensively the uh, Protestant Reformation, before this she goes to the Pilgrim Fathers. So the Pilgrim Fathers is what? It's an introductory subject to what? to the Heralds of the Morning, but what, what is story is the Pilgrim Fathers about? Just historically, what is, the, the what is it? The founding of America. Sorry? The founding of America. The founding of America. So the, it's the shifting of the story from where to where? Europe to the US. So we're going from Europe to, uh, to the United States. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we were going to look at that prophetically, we're going from the sea to the land. Mm -hmm. So she's already introducing, um, just from the structure of the chapters, where she wants to take us. So the Heralds of the Morning, we could be wrong on this because we, we, what I want to do is I, I want us to try and view her thoughts, see how she thinks before we actually read what she's saying, how she wants to guide us. And I'm suggesting that the Heralds of the Morning is something that's going to happen in America because her shift has now uh, gone from Europe to the United States we're not even in 1798 yet, although you could argue prophetically we may be. And so that's why I would say it's not the Protestant Reformation. Uh, Brother Gregory, uh, sorry, Graham, you had your hand up before. What were you going to say, sorry? The same as what you've just said, but also that the Herald is giving a warning, and if it's 300 years previous, then everyone will have passed away who heard that warning, so the warning would be as Okay, so if the warning's too far ahead, it doesn't serve the purpose that perhaps we might want it to. Brother Tyler. I might be wrong, but another explanation of mourning might be the second coming as they see it. Okay, so um, w w we've gravitated to the time of the end, and uh, now you're suggesting actually maybe not the second advent, uh, sorry, uh, time of the end, maybe it's the second advent. So I'll put the time of the end and the second advent. Any other, pe any other thoughts of what it might be? Not Sunday law or anything like that? No? Okay, so we'll work with those two at the moment, unless someone's got any strong opinion. Um, so we've dealt with what the morning could be. Um, so next word is herald. What is a herald? Brother Graham's uh, told us a herald, so if you remind us, what is a herald? A person bringing a message. So it's the person who brings the message. Anyone else? I, I, does everybody agree? I think that's, a, that, that's um, correct. Anyone else give, want to give a definition? So you want to say an angel, so an angel is what? A messenger, that's what the word itself means. So I'll put um, angel, but I'll put a messenger. So it's a messenger, obviously, who brings the message. Any other thoughts about heralds? A harbinger. Um, so we've gone from one, perhaps not difficult word, but to a harbinger. What is a harbinger? Maybe not everybody understands what a harbinger is. A warning. Foreteller. Sorry. A foreteller. To foretell. 
Watchman. Sorry? A watchman. A watchman. Someone had their hand up about Herald. Who was it? I was thinking, not the meaning, but I was thinking more of could the heralds of the morning typify those men who brought the first, second, and third angels' messages? Okay, so then you'll disagree that it wouldn't be the time of the end? No, I'm saying that's when, that's when the first angels' message began at that time, so I'm wondering if that's what it's referring to as. So they'd have to be talking about it before. If, if it's a foreteller, the men would be here saying, the time of the end's coming. Okay. Would that, yeah? If we're going to use the word yeah. as a foreteller. As, what is a herald? The context of herald. We know what they are, the person who brings the message, that's correct. Sister Anne? Oh, sorry, I thought you had your hand up. Uh, is it like... Um, news? Yes, news. news. Tidings. Tidings? Mm -hmm. Did you say well, new or news? Well, a lot of newspapers are called heralds. Okay. So, I'll keep with that then because I think that covers that. Any other? King's herald used a trumpet. Okay, so now you want to introduce the concept of a king. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, there's, there's, a re there's a specific relationship about a herald um, so I just put the word king. It's something to do with a king. So if we start thinking about a king, which, what person would we think of that heralds a king in the New Testament? Who's that person that does that work? John the Baptist. Yeah? And why would we say John the Baptist? Brother Gregory, why would, we, why would we label John the Baptist? What, what does he do that would be this work of a herald? He introduces the time of the coming king, which in his time period was Christ. So it's the time of the coming king, because he doesn't even realise Christ is a lamb. He actually thinks, like the rest of his nation, that he's a king, a warrior king, to come and do some work. So he's a herald at that level. So it's a prophecy. Uh, I'll, someone said foreteller, so I'll put it here. Going back to John, John picks up his 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 license to preach from which book? Two books he uses. Malachi and. Isaiah. I thought the Isaiah was going to be the easier one. Malachi I thought was going to be the harder one. Uh, so in Isaiah, what's his job function? Because in Malachi, um, it's about not a king really, is it? You, you, would you identify the king in, in, in Malachi? The, this person who's going to be the herald, who comes before, what, what role is that? The person he's introducing, he's introducing the king in Malachi. But it's to do with the covenant. Um, so I think you could argue that he's introducing Christ as a priest in Malachi, even though he doesn't realise it. What about Isaiah? What's his jo what's, where does he pick up his role from Isaiah? He's a voice crying in the wilderness. What's he doing in the wilderness? What is in that wilderness? Let's go to Isaiah 35 verse 8. Well, let's find out what's in the wilderness. Sister Bronwyn, what's in the wilderness? A highway. So this highway that's in this wilderness um, 
is also introduced in Isaiah chapter 40. So if we go to Isaiah 40, so I'm saying John the Baptist, he says I'm in the wilderness and his job is to do what? Um, if we go to, oh, actually we didn't, we didn't let's read 35, 8. And the highway shall be there and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. Chapter 40. So we'll pick up from verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, this is John the Baptist is going to self-identify here. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. This way is that way, that path that's in the wilderness. Make straight in the desert, that's the wilderness, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. When Ellen White comments on this work, talking about John the Baptist, what imagery does she use, Brother James? Are you familiar? When she talks about the work of John the Baptist and she focuses on this work about the valley and the mountains and preparing the way. Brother Theodore? So, so we, we pick up this word, the forerunner, and what is this, what's the work of the forerunner? To go ahead and prepare the road so that the king can travel on it. So she's going to use this literally. You've got this road. It says mountains and valleys, but they're really potholes and bumps. And this forerunner is going to go and cut down the bumps and fill up the holes so that the ride or the travel of the king behind him is smooth. I think we're, we're all f really familiar with that, but maybe we just didn't remember it. Yeah? Is that, that, is that new to anybody, that idea? Yeah? Okay. Uh, I think it's in Desire of Ages that she comments on that. So... I'm suggesting this, high, this idea, uh, actually no, who, who said king? Yes, so I, I, I think this idea of a king of, or a herald is this person who prepares the way for the king. And this is why John the Baptist thinks that Christ is a warrior king and he's about to destroy the Romans. He's picking that up from this concept here. I know the nation is already got these wrong ideas as well but he doesn't fully understand Malachi no one seems to understand that but even in Isaiah he doesn't understand the, 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 the work of the lamb I think what Ron was saying was that the trumpeter is who prepares the way for the king yes so, so the, the trumpet should be on there so yeah so we're going to uh, uh, move on to that trumpeter because that's what a herald normally does but I wanted us to see it in different perspectives. So in Malachi, he's not introducing the king, he's introducing the priest. Um, from Isaiah 40 and 35, it's this man who prepares the way, and that preparing the way is a workman. He's actually going in with a, a shovel, and he's cutting down those bumps and filling the holes in. He's this workman who prepares the way. And we also have this other idea now, of a herald is someone who's going to blow a trumpet. So there's this trumpet that's going to be blown that's going to prepare the way or let you know that the king is coming. So we can pick all of that up just from the title. Which, which I, I, th I think is, uh, is useful to know, uh, uh, is a useful exercise to do. So we, we haven't finalised what the morning is, time of the end, or the second advent. 
she's picked up this word herald and you'll notice it's not herald in the singular, it's herald in the plural. So there's more than one of them. And as we go through the chapter, it, 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 we'll see it's pretty self-explanatory what these heralds are. Once we see what the heralds are, we'll be able to determine what the morning is. Two nine nine, paragraph one, first sentence. <clears throat> one of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths revealed in the Bible is that of Christ's second coming to complete the work of redemption. Uh, who said second advent, by the way? Is that where you picked it up from, or you just? The, no, I, the relationship between night and day. Okay. So once you get to a mature work like the Great Controversy compared to an earlier work like Spiritual Gifts Volume 1, you'll see that Ellen White, uh, because she has these experienced copy editors, really follows the rules of grammar pretty well. Um, and, you know, when we think about an introduction, the body and the conclusion, uh, she follows those rules pretty well. Um, the lead paragraph, uh, the lead sentence, they, they follow those rules most of the time pretty well and, they, and if you know those rules, um, I'm really bad at grammar, but if you just follow the simple rule of one, two, three, the introduction, uh, the main body and the conclusion You can pr she, you'll see that she pretty much guides and directs you in how to actually read. What's the difference between these three things? At a really simple level. What's the difference between an introduction and a conclusion? Nothing. When I was at school they said, tell them what you're going to say, say it, and then say it again. So there's no difference between them. All you're going to do is just um, let people know what you're going to talk about, then say it, and then just summarise what you've already said. So if we were to take that rule, we have to be careful because we can get caught out. It would appear that the morning is dealing with the second advent, just from the introductory uh, lead sentence of the first paragraph. It's the first thought that she's going to give us but we'd look for further evidence than just the grammar. So it, I'm saying it appears that this is talking about the second advent. We've got a number of other clues. We know it's about the king. We know that uh, Christ, when he comes and returns, he's going to come as a king. Because if that was the second advent, just before the second advent is Daniel 12.1. And why would we connect Daniel 12.1 with the second advent with respect to the concept of a king? So we've got Michael standing up and what happens when he stands up? What does he do? He, cha he changes his garments. Sister Bronwyn? He takes off his priestly garments and puts on his garments of vengeance or his garments as a king. So a cluster of events happen. We normally mark this as the close of probation. He changes his garments from a priest to a king. And there's one more other major thing that he that happens there. What else has happened? About his So the casting down of the incense is connected to a symbol of, I guess, of the close of probation. It has other connotations to it. I was thinking about marriage. This is where the, the, the marriage is consummated. It's all done and dusted now. He's finally married his bride, even before he get, gets here, because we're not the bride. So there's some other garments that he must be wearing, I'm suggesting, which whatever bridegrooms wear. 
So he must be wearing some bridegroom clothes. You can see that when he comes, I can't remember what chapter it is in the, in the book of Revelation, when he comes, he's not dressed as the king, is he? He's dressed in all this white robe, uh, very similar to his bride, who's also dressed in a white robe. I don't know what Jews wore for their marriages. I don't know if they wore the same clothes. Um, but there's a cluster of events that happen at 12.1. So the fact that we've got a herald, the fact that he's now a king, and the fact that she says in her first sentence that it's the most, uh, one of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths in the Bible is that of the second coming. It, it seems to infer that the morning is about the second coming. But we'll read on. To God's pilgrim people so long left to sojourn in the region and shadow of death, a precious joy inspiring hope is given in the promise of his appearing, who is the resurrection and the life to bring home again his banished. The doctrine of the second advent is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures. From the day when the first pair turned their sorrowing steps from Eden, the children of faith have waited the coming of the promised one to break the destroyer's power and bring them again to the lost paradise. Holy men of old looked forward to the advent of the Messiah in glory as the consummation of their hope. Enoch, only the seventh in descent from them that dwelt in Eden, he who for three centuries on earth walked with his God was permitted to behold from afar the coming of the Deliverer. Behold, he declared, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. The patriarch Job, in the night of his affliction, exclaimed with unshaken trust, I know that, thy, that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand in the latter day upon the earth. In my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How many examples has she given? How many? I heard three. Who said three? List the three out. I just kind of oh, you counted as we read, as I read along. Uh -huh. Okay. First one. Three. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Uh, where do we pick that up? From the day when the first pair turned? Yeah? From the uh, day when the first pair turned. So you got Adam and Eve. Next one? Enoch, the seventh in descent. The next one, the patriarch Job, in the night of his affliction. Everybody okay with that? So we've got those three. Um, and God's pilgrim people. Um, to God's pilgrim people, so long left to sojourn in the reading shadow of death, a precious joy, joy inspiring hope is given in the promise of his appearing, who is the resurrection and the life, to bring home again is banished. The doctrine of the second advent is the very keynote of the sacred scriptures. Would we include them as a fourth or not? Yeah? So the whole paragraph is dealing with the subject of the second advent. The lead sentence, the lead paragraph. Sister Tess, uh, you said time at the end. You want to change already? So I'm asking what the morning was. You're saying the morning is, is pre-time of the end? I'm saying the morning is the time of the end, but the herald comes before. Okay, so... Um, we know that the herald comes before the event itself. So you'd place herald and the morning. So this would be the morning.
Brother Theodore, I think you said the same. Well, originally, but yeah, I would change it. You, 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 you want to change it now to that? Yeah, I'd put that as the morning. Okay, and you still want to keep it as the time of the end? Sorry, I didn't I catch that. The marking the time of the end, and the morning would be 1844. Oh, so you're saying the herald is the time of the end. Arrives at the time of the end. And that is heralding the second advent. Um, <coughs> Brother Theodore? That's what I would say to you. So I'll put herald and time at the end. There's this relationship like that. That's what you're saying? Yeah. And other people are saying the herald is the time of the end and it's heralding um, the second advent. Anyone else? Well, Tyler? I see, I'm not necessarily changing my position, but I definitely see some good arguments for what, what Sister Tess is saying with, with because uh, the heralds are the things that point to the, a future thing. Yes. And you have many signs and wonders and things like that that are going to point to mm -hmm. the time of the end or point to, you know, even after that, you have more signs that point to the second advent, but, you know, I see logic for it. Okay, so I put herald. We got told off yesterday. It should be herald. So it, it, it wouldn't if it wouldn't just be the time of the end then, would it? If there's I'm assuming there must be more than one trumpet sound. If we're gonna use the word trumpet. Um, more than more someone used the word harbinger or foreteller. There must be more than one thing that foretells. So either we're going to, if we put in herald there, it's either that marks the first one, but it's not the one. Do you agree with that? Can't be, it can't be a singular thing. Second paragraph, 300.1. The coming of Christ to usher in the reign of righteousness has inspired the most sublime and impassioned utterances of the sacred writers. The poets and prophets of the Bible have dwelt upon it in words with, glow, uh, with words glowing with celestial fire. So here she's going to give some Bible passages that deal about the coming of Christ. Next paragraph. Now she's going to deal about uh, some more. She's going to um, use Isaiah. The first one she's going to use 300.1 of the Psalms. Then she goes to Isaiah. Then she goes to Habakkuk. So all she's doing is developing this argument about people who I'll read the sentence again, 300.1 The coming of Christ to usher in the reign of righteousness has inspired the most sublime and impassioned utterances of the sacred writers. The poets and prophets of the Bible have dwelt upon it in words glowing with celestial fire. And so she, all of these men are going to be talking about the second advent. Point, 301.1 When the Saviour was about to be separated from his disciples, he comforted them in their sorrow with the assurance that he would come again. Let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. So uh, then she switches to the story of Christ. Um, when he is about to leave, she quotes from John and Matthew. Next paragraph. The angels who lingered upon Olivet after Christ's ascension repeated to the disciples the promise of his return. This same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. And the Apostle Paul 
speaking by the same spirit of inspiration, testified, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. Says the prophet of Patmos, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. So here she's quoting or referencing the angels, Paul and John the Revelator. Three hundred one, paragraph three. Before we read that one, I'm sure you'll read it now. We've picked up the word herald, so the herald infers that there's more than one thing. So when people are saying time of the end, are we going to change that to doing this? Heralds in the plural, beginning from the time of the end. Is that how you want to structure that, Sister Brother uh, Tyler? So. I think you have to. You would have to put the heralds before. It, it would have to, if even for the second advent, you'd have to start where the other age is. You know, before the time of the end. Okay, so you've got a third option. John the Baptist who was in the wilderness. That's the. So you want to do it, uh, oh sorry, like this, even before the time of the end. I didn't understand your logic. Uh, John the Baptist, he was in the wilderness, and the wilderness is the Charles system. And also the time of the end, depending on how you're going to apply that. Uh, you said uh, John the Baptist was in the wilderness. Yeah. And when did he enter into the wilderness? Give a rough guess. Because what you've done is sneaky. <laughs> you've got the time of the end, and you've got wilderness here, I believe, because that's what he's doing. He's putting wilderness here, mm -hmm. saying we have to have the herald here in the wilderness before the time of the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, when's John born? Um, yeah. So he's born here, so he could never have been here, could he? He enters into the wilderness. I don't know what age, maybe 12, maybe when he was born, because they go into the country, I think, even before he's born. So he's in the wilderness here. You know, we, we, we've put the 1260 and we bring it into our reform line. You've probably seen that done. Even if you don't know how you do that, even without knowing how you do that, you know that you have the license to do that. Why? Why, Brother Daniel? I, I've just said, I'm just asking you to not something new. I just want, I'm just making sure that we're all understanding what we just said. Okay, so I think most of us, if you've been in the movement for any length of time, we've got the time of the end and we've got 1260. And we've said in various ways, we can put a 1260 here because 1260 is a wilderness, yeah? And <clears throat> this wilderness can be considered 1260, what else? 70, uh, I'll put three and a half as that, I'll put 126 as that. The Israelites leave Egypt, and they, yeah, so it's 40 years. So, they're the three major ones, the 12, 60, 17, 40. Um, and we can easily put a 40 years here. So, we can mark this as a wilderness. So, you might say, well, how do you do that? How do you put a, t a wilderness after a wilderness? So, my question was, based upon what Brother Daniel said, because he said, what did you say? Okay, so I did a little picture here. So what's the easiest evidence that we know we can put a wilderness in this story, Brother Daniel? Uh, I know that from 9-11 we have three and a half of Jesus' ministry. So no, really, really easy. Brother Tyler. John. John, the very argument that you gave. Because John is born here, and as soon as he's born, his parents are going to, I think even before he's born, 
I think when she's impregnated, they leave and they go to the, I think the hill country of Judea. So they go into the wilderness and he's born in the wilderness. Just, and he says, I'm a voice in the wilderness. So he identi his whole ministry is identified as being in the wilderness. And you only see John here. So just at a really simple level, you can see that. So the other arguments become more sophisticated about in the midst of the week, you have three and a half years, and you can start using arguments like that to develop a wilderness. But the simple one to do is just to say, John was in the wilderness, he testifies to it. We, it's a plain reading of scripture, it's not complicated, we, we, we could see that. Okay, so we're in 301 paragraph three. About his coming, cluster the glories of that restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 321. The long continued rule of evil shall be broken. The kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. They shall reign forever and ever. The glories of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it. Um, so I won't carry on reading. It's the first sentence. About his coming cluster the glories of that restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So it says God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets. We've seen multiple evidences that she gave. We didn't read, um, we didn't actually read the Bible passages, but over and over again, these holy prophets have been speaking about what subject? Second Advent, it says, about his coming, cluster the glories of that restitution of all things. What does that uh, phrase mean? About his coming, the second coming, that's straightforward. It's the bit that follows that. So about his coming, cluster the glories of that restitution of all things. Obviously, restitution of all things is picking up Acts 3.21, so it hits into a Bible uh, uh, passage. How do we read um, cluster the glories? What cluster. is that? Cluster seems to indicate a lot of things happening very, very quickly. So you're saying cluster um, has the connotation of rapidity, rapidness. Anyone else? It's a group usually. It's a group. It's a group yeah. So it's a, it's a group. Any characteristics about this group, just from the word? Right. Sorry? Together. They're together. So it's, it's, it's essentially a group, and in some shape or form, they're together. So it could be geographically, it could be conceptually. So we would say that this movement is a cluster, even though um, we're not geographically together, we're spread all over the world, but what keeps us together is you know, our belief systems, our concepts, our truths, the things that uh, we hold to. So a clustering of, uh, the cluster of, about his coming, cluster the glories of that restitution of all things. So what does that mean? What are the glories? It says cluster the glories. So I'll do a little picture. If we, if we use this concept that um, Brother Clayton just gave us, so uh, I'll do people. And they've all clustered together or gathered together. Are we okay with that concept? That's what clustering is. Yeah? So. What are the glories? How, would, how do we read what concept? I'm not asking you to define you know, specifically what they are, just conceptually, what would the glories be in the context of that sentence? Righteous I don't mean it in that sense, it could well be. Um, but conceptually, if we're gonna say, it says the class, um, Cluster the glories. Brother Bob? The truth. 
Uh, truths, truths. Yeah. Someone said. The messages. The messages. Right, With, uh, The first paragraph says one of the most solemn and yet most glorious truths revealed in the Bible, in that it is Christ's second coming to complete the great work of redemption. So it's the truth of the second coming. About his second, about his coming. I shouldn't. It says um, I've added the word second. About his second coming. Cluster the glories of that restitution of all things. So, would you be happy in this picture work that these are the glories? Is that right? So, it, it, if they were people coming together in this group, each of one of these people would be a glory. Does that make sense? Whatever the glories are, I'm not saying it's not truth. I'm just saying, just conceptually, the way, I've, the way I read that is that these glories have all come together in one place or one time in, in, in some way. And what are they doing? What are these glories doing? Brother Richard. About what? Uh, if, if, we're, if we're going to pick up this idea of heralds and uh, prophecies and watchmen, harbingers, what are they doing? The rest, uh, they're, they're speaking the restitution of all things. Okay, so each of these glories have come together and they're going to speak about the restitution. That's exactly what I was going to say. Okay. About his coming, cluster the glories of that restitution of all things. <clears throat> which God has spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets. So, the restitution of all things, what is that? Is that a specific, specific event? A, a way mark or what? <clears throat> what are the restitution of all things? Sorry? Paying, did you say? Yeah. Paying through sin? Paying for your sins. Oh, paying for your sins. Restitution, right? Yep. I just wanted to point out maybe we should define restitution. Okay, so what does restitution mean? Repaying a debt, repaying a back. Restoring, restoring it. Fixing it. Okay, so something's going to be restored that's not in its original condition. It's going to be, be taken back to its original condition whatever the process of that is. About his coming, cluster the glories of that restitution of all things. Do we agree that's the second coming? I keep on saying second coming. So I've got second coming. And then I've got... the glories are we okay with that the second coming the glories what is the what are all of the things that are being restored it says restitution of all things what are the things that are being restored uh, unless, I'm, uh, uh, unless you read it differently. I don't know how we're reading that. His people redeemed, the earth remade. Uh, the people redeemed, the earth remade. The kingdom's restored. The kingdom's restored. Brother Tyler? Everything that's been spoken of by the prophets since mm -hmm. all the way before. Is how she said it. It's just everything. So everything. Everything that they said. <laughs> Sister Bromwich? Yes, if you go up and ask. Three and all that's exactly what it's saying. It's everything that's spoken by the prophets. Brother Larry? I have a quote in Prophets and Kings, 6, 7, 8, paragraph 2. It says, In the time of the end, every divine institution is to be restored. Then she talks the breach made in the law of the time of the Sabbath. She talks about uh, <coughs> foundations, come down, I mean, all kinds of things she's talking about in there. Brother Bob? One of the 
thought here that came to me is when you look at the fact that they're clustered, if something had the cluster, but prior to that, maybe it was scattered, but now they're, 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 they're the clustering, so it, I think that ties in as well. Go from a scattering to a gathering. Okay, so um, you said a lot there. So this idea of clustering is a group, yeah. and so you've picked up this idea that all these things that were separated mm -hmm. have now come together, these glories. And someone said, um, you said, my sister, what were they? The glories, what would you say they were? Truth. Truths. And then Brother Dan, you picked up the first sentence in the paragraph, in the chapter. So, we'll call it truths. Okay, so, carry on with what you, says, with what you said, Brother Bob. All of these things are now coming together. You said a bit more than that. Yeah. But I interrupt you prematurely, perhaps. It's okay. I see that if previously there was, there, was, there was a scattering. Oh, yes. Okay. So you want to pick up the concept of scattering and gathering. So we can pick up that concept from this idea of clustering. Brother Tyler. Uh, this seems a lot, what we're describing seems a lot like the idea of the effect of every vision that everything kind of converges. I don't know what that, what does that mean, effect of every vision? First of all, where's that taken from? Ezekiel 12. Okay, so it's Ezekiel 12. Uh, maybe we'll read that. I've heard the phrase. Sister Rachel, do you know what that means? Effect of every vision? No. Okay, so I'm not the only one. <laughs> We're together. Uh, verse 22. Um, the section begins in verse 21. Ezekiel 12, 22. Son of man, what is that proverb that ye have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth? Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel, but say unto them, the days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. What, what's the question towards me? <laughs> uh, you said, you said, I need help to do this, because my memory doesn't work that well. Um, you said, this looks to me, what we're reading from the Great Quantity, like the effect of every vision, and I think you're, what you're saying is that all of these prophets, these holy men, from the beginning, have all put their two pennies worth in, and you're saying it sounds to you like effect of every vision. So I'm saying, it sounds like a Bible verse, it's Ezekiel 12. So I'm saying, what does that mean? What did you mean by effect of every vision? I mean that these, in the context of Ezekiel 12, they're saying... I'm not trying to force you to use Ezekiel 12 in, in its okay. original context, but just, it was a Bible verse, what did you think? What, what do you understand oh, that means? My yeah, what saying. I'm saying that the effect you have all these visions and they're all given in different times or whatever, and they're being they're applicable to one moment or one to one event or one time, and they're all taking pass at the same time. Okay, they're so all pointed to one or one moment. Here's this one moment, and this is Ezekiel. Uh, I'll put one moment. Are you okay that with, with that, Sister Rachel? And... I don't necessarily mean a moment. It could be a time or, you know, it's, it's one... You, know, it's, you want to change it to event? Uh, sure. You know, I guess there's progressiveness in an event. So there's this singular event and the definition of a vision, <coughs> we can substitute the word prophecy, is a prediction. So, there's uh, V3, V2, and V1. So there's these multiple visions that have been given, and they're all targeting this one event. Is that what you're saying? So it says, 
the effect of every vision, there's three of them, and they're all going to go into effect. So we don't normally use the word effect. What word do we normally use? Fulfilled. So all the vision is going to be fulfilled here. Is that how Ezekiel is using that? Is he, that's how you're using it. Is Ezekiel using it that way? I'll give you a choice. Yes or no? <laughs> Multiple choice. I'm not sure. <laughs> yes. 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 Okay, so some, any no's? Who said no? Someone said no? Sister Tess, did you say no? Yes. Yes, she said no. Um, <laughs> how is Ezekiel using it? Okay, uh, I would argue that yes, he is, because this first vision, who gives it? You can, I don't say, you can name, name anyone you want to. Sorry? Jeremiah. Okay, so I'll, put, I'll say Moses here. So I put Moses, uh, then we'll put Jeremiah here. Um, and maybe we'll put Isaiah here. All of these prophets are targeting one event. They're all talking about a singular event even though we don't realise it. Uh, we could put Daniel here as well as an example. So all these people are targeting a singular event. And that's, so you're saying it sounds like effect of every vision. Yeah, and the, the point, my other point was that they all cluster. These glories cluster together at a, at a point. All the, gl are the glories, these glories. Okay, so in this thing, what is the glories? The truth. It's the, it's the prophecies. Unless I miss using my own example. <laughs> okay, so um, here are the glories. And the glories are all going to cluster. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And you didn't want to make it a singular point. Well, it, it can be. Yeah. Then they wouldn't be glories, would they? There'd be glory, singular. Because he says, uh, okay, did you have your hand up, Brother Theodore? Well, just dealing with um, uh, that effect of every vision, the word effect is the word debar, which means word or matter. And it's just saying that all of these prophecies are going to be fulfilled. And Ezekiel's specifically dealing with his time, the destruction of Jerusalem. Are you happy with that concept? Does that fit in with what you've just yeah, said? Yeah. Yeah? That's an agreement? Yeah. Okay, so the question I was going to ask that just now was, what is the event, and Brother Theodore is saying, this is uh, Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. Are we all okay with that? That's what Ezekiel is speaking about. Whatever we want to do with that verse, we will do, but that's what he means. So when Moses talks about it, <clears throat> Moses might have a spin and some kind of idea, some kind of thought that is not exactly the same as Jeremiah, that is not exactly the same as Isaiah. So as an example, and I'm not, don't, don't use these, these three things as examples because they're not. When we talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, we know it's a singular event, but there's a clustering of things that are happening there, aren't there? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the simple th way you could look at it is you go to Jehoiakim. There's some kind of captivity that goes on there. Daniel's taken. Then Jehoiakim, and then Zedekiah. So there's this progressive um, eating away of the freedoms and the rights of the people in Jerusalem. And it culminates in the final destruction where they you know, literally take down buildings. So there's a clustering of events and perhaps Moses is focusing on one idea, Isaiah is focusing on another point or, or concept, all clustering around this singular event. 
Rather Clayton, you're looking well, trouble. I, I don't understand your point you made earlier about the, the <coughs> singular of glories versus glory when you were talking back there. What, what, I, what I'm s saying is, whatever Moses is saying, he's not saying this on the first day of the first month, Nebuchadnezzar is coming. And he's not saying, on the first of the first month, Nebuchadnezzar is coming. They're not all saying exactly the same thing. That's what I meant. Okay. If they were all saying exactly the same thing, there wouldn't be glories, it would just be one truth, and there's no clustering, because they've all come to a singular point. That, that's how I've understood that clustering. They're all saying something slightly related to this event. No. Anybody got their hand up? Yeah. I just want to say that if you look at the whole history of understanding that when God himself spoke <coughs> about Sinai, and the people didn't want to hear God's voice anymore directly, and so God said he would... He would use people he would raise up people to speak his words and they would be his words and I understand that what we're talking about here is that all of God's words that have been spoken through his prophets are coming to pass I'm still kind of stuck on the cluster, the glories of that restitution. We, we haven't finalised that sentence yet. We haven't finished it, okay. if you're still struggling with that. Okay. So uh, I want to just summarise. We'll pick up in this afternoon's class. We're looking at the first angel's message and we're going to look at it through the lens of the great controversy. <clears throat> The first time the first angel's message is mentioned is in chapter 17. We began, we began at the beginning of the chapter. And in the midst of just looking at the subject of the first angel's message, what I want us to do is to uh, think about how we read, how we approach inspiration, so that we can come to... We, we can begin to use better techniques about how we read what's written. So that, that's going to be the main idea about our classes. What we've seen is just from the title, it talks about the heralds of the morning. These are messengers that talk about or predict something that's about to happen. We're not sure what that thing is, whether it's the time of the end or the second advent. There are more than one thing uh, that talk about this morning. We've then uh, come to 301 paragraph 3. Now it talks about a clustering of glories. So I'm suggesting, even though I didn't say explicitly, that the heralds are the clusters. These cluster of things, or clusters of glories, people are suggesting that their truths are a certain <coughs> body of evidence that are all going to come together in a certain place like this. And these are the things which I'm suggesting are the heralds. We haven't finalised that yet. Um, and we'll try and nail that down this afternoon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We want to ask for a special blessing upon us as we begin our um, semester. Please direct our thoughts and our hearts and our minds to the most holy place where Jesus is ministering on our behalf. As we consider, Lord, the great Second Advent movement and how those truths are being fulfilled in our own history and how we are participating in these things, we want to ask for a rich blessing upon the classes that we're going to have in the coming weeks. We ask, Lord, that we would have an atmosphere of love and respect in this school, that we would share our thoughts and our ideas one with another. Be with us, Father, and bless us. Bless the food that we're to eat now. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.